Uh, and welcome everybody, pleased to be here for what sounds like a new but exciting initiative in Teaching and Learning Week. And uh, yeah, it's a great opportunity for us to be able to share some thoughts and I guess get some feedback and a few other ideas from a broader group about the work that we've been doing here in HSM on simulation. And I'm going to introduce that shortly, but um, by way of introduction, we're going to focus on two quite specific kinds of simulation. One is some screen-based simulation that we've been doing in our so-called virtual hospital. Uh, but the other is we're actually going to play out a face-to-face -face simulation for you, like we would do down in our uh, clinical skills area. So we're going to be doing two of those things. And for both of them, we're going to present some of what we do, and I guess be keen to have some discussion from you about what you think about it, and I guess some thoughts about what its impact is, about the way that we do it, and at least what we would like to think is where else can we take this, because for us we're always looking for new opportunities to do this, both in the undergraduate arena uh, and in the postgraduate arena as well. And uh, to add to Linda's introduction, just so you can have a little bit more perspective on my background in this, uh, I work half-time here at Bond, where I lead the practitioner theme, which involves the clinical skills that I guess is the focus of today. Uh, but the other half of my working life, I work at the Gold Coast Health Service as an emergency physician. And so <clears throat> I'm fortunate to be able to do some of these simulation activities with many practicing clinicians. And I learn a lot both from what we do with the students in terms of how to improve that, but also a lot from what we do in both clinical practice and in clinical simulation at the hospital to think about how we can make our student-based simulations as real and as authentic as possible. So I mention that really just by way of context. I've got a couple of exciting photos of the simulation that we do up at the Gold Coast Uni Hospital as well. So uh, by way of introduction, as I said, simulation is not new and nor is it by any means unique to healthcare. Uh, people have been using simulation for learning in aviation uh, and in education for years and years and I guess uh, plenty of movies we see simulation of space flight and some of my friends in simulation worlds are involved with that and get to work in places like NASA which is clearly very close to as good as being at Bond. But uh, I guess this is when we think about what simulation is essentially it's trying to recreate in our case some clinical experience by which our students or learners can practice what they do in a safe environment. And that's the primary premise, but there are some other advantages as well. And if you look at the picture up there on the top right, this is a uh, simulation that we might do with a more senior group where we might be practicing, for instance, doctors and nurses and a team working together. And that is quite a difficult thing to practice when you're really looking after someone who is incredibly unwell. You don't get time to stop and pause and think, how are we going? Uh, and yet it's very hard to do any way other than actually doing it. You really can't learn about teamwork just from reading an article. But I guess simulation is broader and certainly we also use simulation for some very focused things like procedural skills and practicing putting in IV lines. This is simulation. And I guess something that uh, I felt was already done extremely well when I came to Bond was a lot of work with simulated patients in terms of practicing communication skills, consultation skills, and that really is the backbone of how we uh, help our medical students get to be able to have good conversations with patients is get them to simulate those with our simulated patients before they get exposed to the real ones. Some of these uh, simulators are quite fancy. And uh, believe me, there are a lot of companies in the world who now are extremely good at making plastic men who do all kinds of fancy things and can manifest different kinds of heart sounds, lung sounds, different pathologies, which you would have to traipse the wards for many years to actually find in real patients. So you can almost get expo experience on demand for some of these simulations. Uh, similarly, you can see that material science has advanced, so this is a birthing simulator. You can see what they used to use, um, bits of hessian stuffed with hay, and uh, now we've got more fancy plastic things, and in fact now the latest version of this really does feel like human skin if you palpate the abdomen and you can actually find what uh, gestation the patient is and then actually do a delivery and things actually look and feel much more realistic. Just as an aside, there are two industries that healthcare simulation owes a huge amount to. One is the gaming industry because they've done all this stuff. The other, and I'll leave you to make the analogy, is the porn industry. <laughs> so this is probably one of the fancier type surgical simulators that uh, are in use, particularly in postgraduate training now. This is training for laparoscopic surgery and essentially those um, instruments that the practitioner has his hands on 
are so good that they have what's called haptic technology, i.e. if you puncture the gallbladder, you'll feel it give. If you're touching a bit of bone, you'll feel it really hard. And so this is very fancy stuff that can now try and recreate, as I said, um, the experience of doing this without exposing the patients to the learning curve of this practitioner. And just to give you some idea what they've found now, and this is a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which has quite a high mistake rate for your first 50. So believe me, if you're going to have your gallbladder out, just ask, have you done 50 yet? <laughs> and if they haven't, find someone else. But if they've done 50 on a simulator, they hit the learning curve at the same point as if you've done 50 on patients, and that has now been demonstrated. So this is a very powerful tool for patient safety as much as it is for practitioners feeling good and confident with their skills. So here's, um, I guess, coming back to our context, and again, just talking a little bit about technology, though. That is one of our simulated patients who has got some palpitations. Now, you would think her heart rate was 180 if you looked at her monitor there, but it's not. But we've got an iPad there that talks to another iPad that makes her heart rate 180 on the screen. And so we can now manifest our simulated patients as being sicker than they are. They can look like they've got low blood pressure, low oxygen levels. Uh, they can look like they've got a fast heart rate. They can look like a whole range of things that previously were very difficult to do. So this means that we can now, I guess, accelerate our students' exposure to somewhat sick patients much better than we were able to before. And these are the things that we know worry junior doctors and these are the things that Fortunately, they don't get enough exposure to because not everyone is that sick. And as I said, this is probably a picture um, more, more representative of the kind of work that we do in our postgraduate learners. So this is actually at the Royal Brisbane. This is in our trauma room. And here we've actually got the trauma team looking after a patient that's been brought in by a paramedic, has clearly got multiple injuries, and the team have to do the things they would normally do. And then get to sit back and debrief and go, what did we do well, what did we not do well? Which is often an opportunity we don't get when we're in the real world because we're on to the next one, um, probably making the same mistakes that we made in the last one. So with that in mind, as I said, I'm going to take a case study and look at a couple of ways of doing that. Um, just before I do that, and I'll just go back one picture because it's a nice one, I'll just pause for a minute and if anyone wanted to sort of opera, offer up any of their own experience or ask any questions at that point, just in that very broad uh, introduction. No? Don't, what, you're saving up your really good question. Oh, okay, yeah. I'll ask okay. question then. Oh, yeah. I am curious because uh, I don't know to what extent people are here from health science and medicine, but your experience, so you talked about two industries that have brought in knowledge of simulation to medicine. What about medicine's impact on other fields and simulation? So I wonder what, whether you have any ideas of things that you've learned more generally about simulation that apply to other disciplines like architecture, um, Sure. Um, yeah, and look, some, it depends a little bit on the domain of learning for which you have a focus. So some of the procedural skills uh, have things in common uh, with people that do procedural work. And there was a great uh, presentation at Amy, which Roger Kneebone, who's a surgeon, did a joint workshop with some tailors on thread management. And so the idea that people share some common skill sets. Similarly with psychologists, that's quite easy because our communication, I guess, is the overlap where we are often focused on the same things. So of course, a lot of them would do some of the same role plays. Role play is a simulation. And certainly, um, probably the law people would suggest that they invented this in the first place with their moot court and some of those other simulation environments that they use. Um, so I think other industries are doing it. But just to give you some idea about the size of our industry, you know, healthcare simulation is, you know, I don't know, half a billion dollars a year. You talk about porn and gaming. <laughs> we're talking about 200, 300 billion dollars a year. You know, it's a much, we're actually much smaller than most. And aviation uh, is the other one, I guess, that has some of the similarities in what we might call human factors. So how teams work together. And that's probably the area that we have done a lot of shared work with. And interestingly, the people who look at human factors in aviation, actually throw up their hands and go, it's much more complex in healthcare because the actual patient journey of a single patient involves so many interactions that it's actually much more complicated. So it's an interesting question and I think we'll yet to see exactly how. Mm. Yeah. Oh, just an 
I guess obviously veterinarian work would be benefit from that as well, and dentistry and those things. Yes, and dentists have been doing procedural work again for a very long time. Um, their equipment has recently gone like this in terms of how good the technology is. They, was, they were always doing head on a stick stuff, but now they've got all this haptic technology and virtual reality, and so that I think that has been the next leap for people. And probably in the procedural skills, the next leap is probably with 3D printing, because we'll be able to print pathology on demand to practice our procedural skills with. Um, I was at a airway workshop a couple of weeks ago in Sydney, and we were using cadavers. And that was fantastic because we had all this range of anatomy, um, but it's really unpleasant in lots of ways. Lots of people don't like using animal or human tissue. And uh, pretty soon, I think in five years, we'll just be able to take a CT scan and then do a 3D replica of that head, and then we'll be able to practice on that material. Mm. Yeah. In terms of the, uh, the people who have gone through the simulation and the training and then moved in, into the real world situation, has there been any research or even anecdotal um, comments and feedback in terms of the authenticity of the original training? Yeah, and that's hard to say because when we say simulation, we obviously mean such a range of so-called authenticity. Um, and there's a couple of words that are hard to use. So the simulation world has used this word fidelity a lot, but now people are moving into physical resemblance and realism. It turns out that the things that make the biggest difference aren't always the physical resemblance, but rather what we call the task fidelity. So if some of these senior students have had to actually talk to someone who looks like they're having a heart attack and explain to them, that will be much better for them than if they talk to a guy who's plastic, uh, even if the conversation's the same. And there's so much subtlety with that that it's hard to compare apples and oranges. But to come back to your point, there is quite good evidence for the procedural simulation. There is less good evidence for the uh, human factors and cognitive things. There is certainly a lot of anecdotal, I felt much more confident as a result and so I was able to go in there, but that is hard to quantify. Uh, one thing we do know probably is that people do feel less stressed and there's a lot of work in something called stress inoculation training and people have done like cortisol swabs and heart rate monitoring and if you go through lots and lots of high stress simulations, suddenly your heart rate's only 65 when the guy's dying. <laughs> and you just saved the life. <laughs> Which is what happens, you know, after 25 years of doing it in the real world, but in this way you can probably put people through their paces over a weekend and achieve some of the same things. You still need the 25 years for some other things, but it's an adjuvant that is very good for some things, uh, but it, and I guess this important point, it can't completely replace the 25 years. Mm. All right, um, you can ask them later once they've done their performance how good they are. <laughs> So as I said, one thing I want to think about now is to take a case study and to think about how we would play out these two kinds of simulations. So if you read up there, this is a kind of uh, situation where we run into quite frequently in the emergency department. We have a lot of patients present with chest pain. A smaller number of them actually are having a heart attack. And when you look after someone who has a heart attack, the first time that you do this, it is extremely frightening. It involves a complex series of knowledge and skills. It involves things like being able to take a good history and know what's important. It involves things like doing a physical examination and being able to interpret that. It involves interpreting investigations like an ECG. Uh, and then it involves actually communicating with the patient about what's going wrong with them. And then it involves things like working with your team to make sure the right treatments happen in order to uh, improve this patient's outcome. So as you can see there, there's a variety of domains of learning that we would say went into this integrated skill set. So the first thing I want to show you is how we would do this in our virtual hospital environment. So this is something that we've been doing, which is essentially a case-based learning and it's screen-based simulation. And we have been doing this for the last three years as a flow on from what was our more traditional PBL, where people had paper-based cases and that it triggers learning uh, issues for students and they work as teams and groups and individuals to try and fill in their learning gaps because they've got the context of the case. So I'll show you how we would do this for our students. So to give you some idea about how they would do that in the virtual hospital. So, and I'll show you where we are now. So this is a little app called the Bond Virtual Hospital. And when the students come in, they actually log on to this app and they see something like their dashboard. So a group of six students walks into a room, they don't have a facilitator and they go, which patients are we looking after today? 
uh, and they log in and they go, oh, we've got two new ones. Why don't we see Shane? So Shane might be the equivalent of that patient Mark that we were talking about. So they see Shane and they go, oh, well, let's find out a little bit about him. So here's the story. He's just come in with chest pain, just like we were talking about. Um, he describes it as heavy. They've tried a little bit of treatment with the Queensland Ambulance Service. He feels okay, but he's pretty worried it was his heart. And we put in here a number of what we might call triggers, which add to this authenticity of the case. So here's the resident medical officer's notes about this patient's presentation. So the students get to see what might be real doctor's documentation. So we get the idea about reading notes to find out what's gone on. So this gives a little bit more background detail. Sometimes we might use a video of a consultation with a patient um, in order to be that trigger. They then also get things like the physical examination findings. So again, this is all in the cognitive domain. So these are students thinking about things, not doing them, but thinking about, I've got a problem now and I might need to solve it. So they find out some of those things. They also can look up the patient's vital signs. So they can get a little sense of what's the blood pressure like, what's the heart rate. And then importantly, because clearly these students would be pretty good, they know that there's some tests that would be important, one of which would be the ECG. And so they get to see this first ECG and decide, does this really look like someone who's having a heart attack or not? So again, these are things which would be available uh, in the real world. Um, but as I said, at this point, this is a group of students talking through the uh, problem. So they talk through all those things and just like a standard problem-based learning, there might be a whole range of learning issues that have now been generated for the students. So hang on, what is a ischemic looking ECG? What would be the nature of the pain in someone who is having a heart attack. So already students are thinking about um, what's actually going on here. But then more importantly, because we'd like to think that this is like a virtual hospital ward round, is they need to have a problem to solve. So what they have is their virtual consultant says something to them like, how would you risk stratify this man for his acute coronary syndrome? So they get prompted to do that within the app itself and they have to stump up some kind of answer. And what we know about learning is you've got to commit and then you've got to get feedback on what you do. And so this is one student's answer to that uh, question. And so they've actually come up and said, well, this is what I think is going on. How likely is it that this chest pain really is a heart attack? And so this is quite an advanced answer. Someone else in the group might like to put in an answer as well. So you can see there's an opportunity within the app for people to put in their answer. And they can do that a variety of ways if they wanted to put in a uh, voice memo or a video or a photo. Sometimes people type things out and take a photo of it. Sometimes they put it straight in. So, so that is day one for Shane. So what would typically happen after that is the students having all worked together in groups of six would come into a room with an audience about this size, so with about 20 odd people and a facilitator who is a clinician and we talk through what did you do. So Michelle, what did group A think about Shane? Did you think he's having a heart attack? I don't know, what do you think about that? Trish, does your group have the same view? And so we have then a facilitated discussion or debrief on how the students would manage this case, what they think is going on, sometimes prompt some additional questions, often add some clinical context, often other things come up. Yeah, but how much morphine would you give him if he's in that much pain? So I guess a more clinically based discussion which moves on naturally from the more science-based discussion that the students have had in years one and two. But importantly, we also work through these were the questions you were asked to address and then come back and um, think about how they went with those. Now on day two, which I won't show you, but we find out what happened next. And so there will be a new range of pieces of information. There'll be a new set of questions there might be some changes in the patient condition and a new challenge. But essentially the same format, which is students working through, at least in their heads, what's important and how they're going to manage uh, this patient who's got his chest pain. So I'll just pause again there for a moment because as I said, this is one version of how we would approach some of those domains of practice, but clearly there's some that are still yet to be addressed. Questions? All right, I might ask the students if they want to comment because all of these students have done some virtual hospital. Yes? Because uh, well, us two years ago, we, this was rolled out for us as a sort of trial, um, and prior to that, we were doing the PBL. So are we now finding that we're transitioning more to this and like in early years for placing PBL? Or what's the trajectory with us? Yeah, so um, as we said, when we first started doing this, it was very much a 
replacement for what we'd been doing with PBL. Whereas I think we've got a little bit smarter now and we've said actually this is an evolution of what we've done in PBL. And so uh, what we now are trying to do is make the virtual hospital cases orientated within a clinical block. So instead of doing gastroenterology, we're doing medicine and surgery and child health. And the, I guess this is important transition for the students to go from systems-based learning to clinically applied type of learning. Um, but that said, I think there's still a limit to what it can achieve. So we see it as very much in this instance, a preparation for practice, although it can also be used as an adjunct to practice. And the example of that is uh, say in the ED term, so students are already seeing real patients, but it might be when you come to my emergency department, you spend seven weeks there, you see some people with chest pain, but you don't see anyone with renal colic and you don't see any kid with a minor head injury. So it's a way of providing, well, let's just make sure everybody sees these top 15 cases in the virtual hospital so that we can at least have a little bit of a safety net of important topics. So it, it can mitigate and smooth out some of the education by random opportunity, which is the real world. Very high fidelity, but sometimes just missing big chunks. Uh, you certainly could and you know you can it's a bigger debate about platforms and apps and web-based platforms but this is an app that we developed in conjunction with a, with an app developer um, it's actually pretty straightforward for most things the only complex bit is that bit about the team chat because we've got to work out which people can see which people's chat that's probably the most complex part of it as an app um, but certainly we also duplicate this on iLearn so most of the information and the questions are on there so there's actually lots of ways you could do that this just looks kind of cute um, and I guess if there is a third third important learning outcome. I guess where I started with this was I was so frustrated by our electronic medical record at the hospital and I went, surely we should be using mobile devices for our managing patient care. And my hope is that the people sitting behind you in not too many years will actually be managing their patients like this, the real ones. And they'll have their x-rays and their blood tests and all their notes available on their mobile device. And they will be able to order new tests, communicate with their team, and the fellow I did the app with, he does that this for real patients and real hospitals. So I'm hoping that this kind of gets doctors being able to know what they like and what's useful because my generation of doctors, the IT people come and say, what do you want in the EMR? And we go, I don't know, what's good? And so I think a lot of our current electronic medical record has suffered as a result of us not even knowing what would be useful. Yeah. yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Has this, to what extent are hospitals and Uh, in Australia, none, in terms of ele actual electronic medical records. We can get our emergency department patient tracking system on an iPad, but most, unfortunately, big state health departments have all these legacy systems that won't talk to each other. So, for instance, when I, log, when I look after a patient, I have a separate login for the pathology, the radiology, the emergency department record, the hospital medical record, the mental health record, uh, and a separate one for something else again. It's unbelievable unbelievable but I, and it's not and so usually because of those competing systems the trick is in trying to get something like an app interface that would pull them all together and uh, I don't think state health departments are in a hurry our app developer is in the US and obviously because they've got smaller hospital networks they can be more nimble and so there's more uptake over there hmm. so much more complex question yeah there is an old question They're trialing it where they give them, previously they have just phones that people call them on, but they're trialing it, giving them an iPhone that has an app on it, and if a patient needs reviewing, the nursing staff can upload information about that patient, where they are, why they need reviewing, and the junior doctors can tick it off when they've seen it or prioritise it in terms of how urgent it is, but I think they're still trialing that out. Yeah. And there's been some good efforts. The junior doctors themselves are at the forefront of this <laughs> for a variety of good reasons. Yeah. Yeah, Link. Can I just say, having used the app or a scenario such as a career and slightly different one, and then being called to see that in real life um, was, a, was a brilliant combination of the two. Yep. Um, so I felt quite confident, pretty confident, of course, it was the first one I'd attended, but quite confident going in there because I knew what was going to happen, I knew what drug I should be using. 
I only had then to cope with the stress of being put on the spot for two years rather than all of those things at yeah. once. So the combination of the cognitive base and the reality base was... Um, mm, yeah. And so when Lee wrote me that email, I just went, yes! <laughs> <laughs> Not to put too much um, education in, in, in the medicine, I mean, in terms of assessment, does he have to deal with um, assigning, a, other than obviously if he died or if he had, had survived? <laughs> yes, we like to have a slightly more fine-grained outcomes yeah. than that. <laughs> Is there a degree of assessment provided? Yeah, so uh, in fact the app developer and I have talked quite a lot about this and there is certainly potential to do that both in terms of traditional ways but also some of the new ways that people use social media for. So you could, for instance, have multiple choice questions embedded in there and you would have right and wrong answers. For some of the domains of practice we're doing, it, multiple choice isn't a great way to assess it. For some things they are though, so you could certainly do that. But the other thing that we've been talking about but not done yet is using things like crowdsourcing and things like likes and dislikes. So the idea where you know that you saw that student's response, if all the other students saw them, and then you could give a variety of stars to it, then the best ones would kind of bubble up. Uh, and the other way of thinking about it was really triggered from thinking about, I don't know if you saw Peter Norvig's TED talk on artificial, his artificial intelligence MOOC. He had 150,000 students in his MOOC. And uh, so how are we gonna assess all these people? Well, he got 10 of them to assess each person's paper. And of course, the reliability when you have 10 people assessing your paper is actually not bad. So rather than one person trying to do the 150,000, he worked out a pretty good way of doing that. So I think because of the spread of any of these, um, I guess, technology-enabled capabilities, if you did have a lot of people participating in the same thing, you could use peer assessment as a modality. But I'm talking blue sky. We haven't done that. But certainly, we've thought hard about what would be an assessment um, usage of it. One new concept that's coming forward is, is similar to that. It's called a leveled or staged peer assessment. So mm -hmm. if you can imagine that at the MOOC level and, and the classes are huge, um, rather than having, having someone who's taking, you know, a first year biology, for example, assess other first year biology students, the problem there being if you're in first year biology, you may or may not know what the right answer is. And often common mistakes are, are, are valued, is you would get someone who's taking second level. Um, assessing the person. Um, yeah. Although, in a medical situation, I mean, how would you evaluate the level of doctor? Would it be use experience? Uh, we have pretty good hierarchy, don't you worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Something we do pretty well. Whether or not any of the people at the top are any smarter than the people at the bottom is another story, but uh, we certainly have the hierarchy down pat. Um, but, but that's a thought, and in fact we have probably more fine grain than that because we have junior doctors, we have doctors in training for specialists, and we have consultants, so there would be ways of doing that, and increasingly there is an emphasis on trying to involve those junior doctors in teaching, and this would be one way of doing it. Yeah. All right, well, we might move on to thinking about how we would do this in terms of a face-to-face uh, -face, um, sim, and I'll just get our PC back here. <coughs> and uh, so just to show you then, oh yeah, thinking about how we would do this in a scenario. So we'll come back to the sort of same case study. And, uh, you know, we've got Mark here, but this time we're going to shift our focus from just knowing what to do to actually doing it. And just as Lee kind of said, there is actually a big leap between those things. It's good to know what you need to do, that is a first step. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient, and certainly clinicians know this. So what we're going to do now is essentially go through a scenario, how we would do it if we were doing a face-to-face -face simulation. And by way of introduction, we do that um, here, but we particularly do it with third, fourth, and fifth year students over at the Rabina, where we have a dedicated facility, and we have physical environments set up not dissimilar to the patient care environment, so bed spaces, uh, clinical equipment, and other things where we can run a face-to-face -face scenario using either a mannequin or a simulated patient uh, in order to demonstrate that. And the sequence of things that we're going to demonstrate here is both the preparation for the simulation, and we're going to do a little round the room here with the students. We're going to show you the first part of a scenario, and then a second part of a scenario, and then we're going to do a debrief. And in each of those, I'm going to ask us to do a little bit of a, 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 little bit of a mind trick, and we're going to go in and out of role. 
Okay, so pretty soon I'm going to get the students to come down and we're going to go in roll as though we were in a simulation session and then I will stand up and we'll go out of roll and I'll invite any thoughts and comments and we'll have a discussion. And then the students are going to go downstairs and they will go back in roll and actually go in and look after the patient, this one or one similar to this, and uh, we'll get to watch that and have a little chat about it. And then they'll come back here and we'll do a debrief. And again, I'll let you know when we're in roll and out of roll. So you got that? You're okay? You're ready to run with it? Because it's a bit of a game. Yeah? Okay. All right. So I might get the students to come. So, and again, to give you a context, so we haven't started yet. We're still out of roll. <laughs> uh, we're imagining that uh, these are final year students. They've just been doing their emergency department rotation. So they may or may not have seen a patient like this. They're towards the end of their rotation. So they've had a fair bit of clinical experience with it. Um, and they know they've come to do some face-to-face -face simulations. Uh, they, and they're aware that my role is essentially going to be a facilitator for their learning and that they're going to be asked to perform both in front of their peers and in front of me. So we'll go enroll. Hey guys, how are you going? Good. Greetings. Um, I know you've been here before, but uh, I know you haven't been here for your ED blocks, so we're going to be doing our scenario-based session today and hopefully getting a chance to pull together some of the things that I'm sure you've actually been doing in your rotation. Uh, and I guess before we go into what we're going to be doing today, it'd be good to sort of just catch up again, just tell me your first name again, and maybe just give me some reflections on what you found both difficult and, uh, and easy in your ED terms. So kick us off, Elise. Yeah, so I'm Elise. Um, I guess I really enjoyed my ED term. I think probably what I've found the hardest is trying to figure out how sick a patient is mm -hmm. and knowing when to, you know, do I have the time to take a full history and examination and prepare what I think is going on and what my plan is before talking to the doctors versus this patient looks really unwell. I may only ask a couple of questions before I call for help. Yep. I think that's probably the hardest Mm. You know, thing is getting that right balance. So. Mm. It's hard, but I think it's a good thing to realise uh, you need to do because you're right, it's not a place where we can always take our detailed history and exam first. So, and we'll certainly be coming back to that because I think a couple of our patients today will be trying to think where the trade off is. Yeah. Hi, so I'm Will. Uh, good thing about ED rotation, very hands on rotation, you get to do a lot of stuff as a student, especially a lot of uh, um, you know, responsibility put on you that mm -hmm. you get to have, which is good. Uh, I think the hardest part of the ED rotation is probably learning to think as you go. Mm -hmm. So being always being ready for the next step, having a plan in mind, or even if it's not a complete plan, have a few steps that you can, you know, get the framework started as mm -hmm. you go. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's probably important. Yeah, so trying to get a sort of structure, um, but in the face of time constraint. Yeah, because yeah. obviously it's a stressful environment and you may not know what the answer is at the start, yep. but you need to develop a sort of way to get there. Yep. Even if I don't know, have yeah. a plan. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. That's my world. <laughs> I'm Shelley, um, and like Will and Elise said, I really enjoyed ED rotations for the same reasons they mentioned, and I thought it was really good practice for internship next year, and a really good um, rotation for initial practice. Yep. Um, and yeah, lots of good procedural stuff. What I found hard was like, yeah, you get an undifferentiated patient in front of you and having to think really widely and like mm -hmm. said, always having a plan. Yeah. Like, even though you don't know the diagnosis, but at least you know, do something to make the patient better. Yeah. And I think you brought up another really important point you know our patients don't come in with heart attack they come in with pain or weakness or an undifferentiated complaint and that um, is both good for learning but it's tough in terms of trying to work out what's going on yeah all right well that, I mean that's they're all points I think that are going to come up in our patients today um, so just by way of thinking about exactly what we're doing today I know you've done some of these before but just to run through it again uh, we're going to go in essentially in pairs and uh, you'll be introduced to the patient the nurse who's looking after them will give you something of a handover about what's been going on uh, and as you know you should just do what you normally do take your history from the patient uh, examine them if there's uh, vital sign charts there medication charts uh, any of those ob sheets feel free to look at them, they'll be important sources of information. Um, and for the purpose of today, we're going to ask you to be junior doctors and you can actually prescribe. So you should, once you've done your assessment, um, begin any treatments that you think are appropriate for you to do. Um, obviously talk to the patient about what's going on, work with the nurse effectively. Uh, at some point, I anticipate, because 
you are students, not fully qualified doctors yet, you probably want some help. And when you do that, you can actually call the senior doctor, get some additional advice and move from there. Um, so again, no need to call too soon, but also once you get to the point where you feel like you're at the level of your scope of practice, um, you just call for help and we'll, we'll go from there. And then obviously we'll come back here and look, I don't mind what we talk about. Um, if it's the clinical aspects of the case, that's great. If it's more about the sort of teamwork and communication, um, that's fine too. Any other uh, questions? No? All good. All right, well, I'll let you guys go into the scenario area and we'll uh, see you back here shortly. All right, and we will go out of roll for a minute. <laughs> So this is kind of the briefing slash preparation phase. And before I say what I think, any thoughts on that? To, to what extent is this authentic? It seemed very authentic yep. to, to what you're doing. Yep. Um, so when would you, so we're going to be watching them on video. Is this actually what happens when they go into the workplace? Are they- We don't have time to sit around like this. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> when, when our, doc, our junior doctors actually video, like. Oh, uh, rarely. Um, and that for a variety of reasons. One is we don't have time to watch the videos. Number two, there's some patient privacy concerns and things like that. Three, you wouldn't know when was the best to capture to sort of get it. This is like a really concentrated, efficient way of doing it. Yes, you're trading off some realism. Probably the thing that we have, which comes to what you, I think you're getting at, is workplace-based assessment. So what we do have both for junior doctors and trainees is a process of assessment in the workplace. Well, I will go and watch them see a patient and we have a structured assessment form that we do with them as well as a discussion. So we do do that, but we tend to use video less. Yeah. Any other questions? The purpose of this, obviously, from my point of view, is twofold. One is to get a bit of a look at them. And so I would tend to decide who was going to be in the first scenario based on who looked most comfortable, to get them talking, because I want them talking in the debrief and reflecting on things. Uh, and also, because this varies between learners, get them OK about engaging in the learning experience. Because they're about to do something in front of us, in front of the, each other. And that is a little bit confronting. And not everybody wants to just jump into that. Some people, not me, like to read the instructions. Very un-Australian, I think. Um, but this is essentially giving the instructions to what you're about to do. And I think it is important. And what we have seen in simulation is when people are thrown in and they don't know, they come back going, oh, that was so unrealistic. Oh, this would never happen. And you see people very hard to engage back in once they've rejected the simulation experience. So this has a few of those things. Um, as I said, I'm a bit lucky because I would have known these students, but not always is that the case for this. We'll see if we can get the picture up. All right, Charlotte, we're ready to go when you are. Like it's difficult breathing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Have you ever had anything like this before? Well, yeah, I've got angina. Yeah. 
So the ECG will be a very critical decision point. Up to now they've been assessing the patient, now they've got the ECG. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I can see that there, yep. Also, five and six. Hang on, come back to that. Yeah, that's and then the one, two, three, four, the cornelates will have ST depression as well. Yeah. So, okay, this, this, this changes it. Yeah, so concern for ischemic changes. Hi, all right. So, what have you, we've given you some more thing now, um, and we've got a chart of anything else at the moment? No, we don't. So, I can get on that and start with aspirin. Aspirin, yeah, and maybe uh, some more little GTN as well. Yeah, all right. And then she'll what, I'll, what I'll do is I might have a quick listen to her heart and okay. then I might call um, the ED or consultant. So we'll pause there, Charlotte. You know, advise us about it. Okay. All right. Alrighty. So 
probably a lot to take in there, but you get a little sense of both the physical environment that we did, um, a little bit of a sense of what the tasks were required, and I'll deconstruct some of it for you, but essentially the patient was in the bed, obviously had chest pain. You could see the nurse there who gave the handover, and the two students had to work out a little bit about what, who was going to do what for a start, which is always a little bit of a trick with that, um, as well as take information from the monitor that was on their left, the ECG, the vital signs, uh, as well as actually the patient themselves. So once again, um, interested in any thoughts or questions based on that first? No, looks like the real thing. <laughs> Remember there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. You. CT was uh, pretty good actually. It was in fact uh, almost a good mapping scenario that was there. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is actually pretty good. And I think one of the things that I like about this is it's a nice pace. Too many people come in and think simulation is about quick, let's do CPR. Whereas actually, this is more like what happens. Things actually go steadily, they take a few minutes to evolve. You, The students are still very stressed. And I think one of the things that we can do for uh, to change the pitch, because I could run the same scenario with quite senior registrars. I would have different expectations of what they would do, but you can actually run the same scenario, but you might change the pace a little bit and you might change some of the degree of difficulty a little bit, but the story is kind of pretty much the same. Yeah, exactly. And in my, you know, as I'm watching this, I'm thinking, well, what am I going to bring up in the debrief? And one of the things I really liked was the way Elise touched the patient to sort of try and give some physical reassurance. I liked the fact that they had actually separated and Will was going to be doing the paperwork sort of stuff. Elise was going to be doing most of the patient-focused things. Uh, you know, they got onto the analgesia early, which I think is important. They weren't waiting until they knew everything that was happening. They knew this patient needed pain relief. So I'm kind of imagining these things that I'm thinking, you know, are going well. But I'm also thinking, well, hang on, what would I have liked? Well, you know, if it was really one of my red I would have liked the ECG another five minutes sooner. Um, you know, I would have liked the aspirin questions. There could have been a few other things that were focusing. And I would have been thinking about at what point should these guys have been calling for help if they were a junior doctor and wanting to explore that a little bit more with them about well, do they still think they're okay on their own or should they have gotten someone else there by now? Yeah. Any other sort of points, questions? Uh, again, the authenticity about the way that you train your students, and I'm also thinking about then not just for your students, but the application to other disciplines as well. How many types of simulations and of different types do you do at what levels with your students and to what extent of debrief? Yeah, so this is a really good question and it's a big debate in the simulation community about what is the right dose of simulation. And obviously that question is hard because that depends on for what are you trying to achieve. So you might only need to simulate some things once and you're okay. But obviously there's so many subtle variations and what is a particularly good thing to do is to run that same scenario with different kinds of heart attacks, with different kinds of physiologic responses and actually get people to tease out the subtle but important differences in the same theme. Uh, but to come back to your question, how much, we do as much as we can, which is probably not quite enough or not nearly enough in terms of preparing for the variety of things. If you look at how much uh, most other high risk industries have as a ratio of training to work, like you think about those astronauts, they train for 99% of the time for 1% of work. We train about 1% of the time for 99% of work. And so I think we could move a lot further in trying to simulate bad things in particular. So it depends what you're trying to achieve. For everyday stuff, which is what I would call this, I think you know it would be good if we were doing some once every month or two. At the moment, our final year students get two sessions in the year like this, so it's probably not enough. They may do some actually within their rotations, but probably not with the same intensity as something like this. For our postgraduate learners, our registrars would do this probably four or five times a year. And again, we would focus on things that they thought they either were infrequent, hence they wouldn't see it in clinical practice, or really important and often badly done in practice. So we pick our marks as to what we would tend to focus on, put it like that. We don't tend to simulate something people do every day because they probably do have the chance to reflect on that in the real world. So I don't know if that quite answers your question, but dose is probably a big debating point in the simulation world. Like I think that we've all learned so much from watching this simulation and then hearing your debrief. Yep. Is that another tool or strategy that you use as well? Yeah, so I work with a group that specialises in teaching debriefing <coughs> who work out of Harvard but they do courses here in Australia as well and uh, most of the time we are debriefing the debriefing because that's what we're doing here. 
and in fact a lot of the workshops that we do involve this, Liz is getting good at that too, um, <laughs> where we actually do essentially try and do a pause and discuss of a simulation within a simulation and we do this in our training so for instance we run simulations of simulations for our faculty development for our simulated patients and for our student tutors to practice both doing and then practice reflecting on doing and uh, so I think that's a really it, it's a vital thing in terms of preparing faculty to be simulation educators which is another important point we haven't touched on yet. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll see. So Shirley obviously isn't in the scenario, but she will be in the debrief. So we'd normally have a group of four to six, depending on how many scenarios we were doing. Two would be in the scenario and two to four would be watching. So they all get a chance of doing, but they also all get a chance of reflecting um, and critiquing and being engaged in the discussion afterwards. So the ratio varies according to the group, essentially. <laughs> we get the SP usually to come in and debrief in role. Uh, uh, <coughs> and you get all kinds of interesting things. Uh, sometimes you get things that aren't exactly what a patient would do, but it doesn't matter. They, there's interesting perspectives always from the simulated patient and the nurse as well. And uh, so both of those things I think are very important in the integrating bit. And that's the bit you can't do with the screen-based simulation. You can never capture the qualitative interactions that are really the essence of the performance that we're seeing here. The better we all get at giving each other honest feedback, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in clinical practice and in education. How do you determine the plot of the simulations in, in terms yeah. of, um, is it strictly storyboarded that you know, four minutes in, suddenly there'll be a big chest, yeah. you know, or eight so, minutes in, someone will mention something that they forgot? Yep, so this is a really good question. So scenario writing is a skill in itself. Um, and I guess the most important thing, and I see this doesn't happen with clinicians often, is to not start with a story, but start with what you're trying to achieve. So if you're trying to achieve integrating the skills, integrating history and exam, dealing with a really sick patient, start with that and then think what's a good story to go in it. And then you write, the way I write the scenario so that the people down there running the scenario know what to do if I ha is that I have stages. So it is exactly like storyboarding. So stage one will be patient in bed, complaining of pain, expected student actions, put on, give analgesia, do a variety of other things. Two, ECG is given, create a decision point, expected student actions, explain to patient, call for help. So there is actually a storyboard and usually what you have is a trigger student action which moves things on to the next phase. But you also might have <coughs> the other thing. We'd, I don't normally go by minutes, but sometimes you might do that um, with more advanced learners. So yes, a storyboard is a good description. All right, uh, and the other thing just to sort of, you may, have, may not have noticed, but there was a lot of small physical resemblance things that we had there, IV lines, monitors, um, things that the patients were attached to. And obviously that takes a whole lot of technical work that's probably beyond the scope of this, but it's important to do that as well as we can. Yeah. I don't know if you have time, but <coughs> within what you have planned, but I'm just, a, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm thinking about the simulation within the simulation within the simulation, because the other thing that we've, Gotten to observe today is the brilliant way in which you teach, where you you not seen anything Sorry, really. I don't want to embarrass you, but um, this is Learning and Teaching Week, and it's about what we can extrapolate from that. And you have this lovely activity, pause, debrief. It's just embedded in what you do. And one of the things that's really been concerning me, um, Linda and I are leading um, a national research project right now on the postgraduate student experience and not to belabor it, but we're having a lot of conversations with PhD students who would like to become academics. And one of the concerns that we're having right now is it's one of the interviewees described it as being pushed off a cliff. Um, that there is no, there's very, very little preparation about how do you, how do you teach and so as I'm watching what you do with your students to teach them the discipline of medicine, 
I'm thinking about what we could bring in more to teach the discipline of teaching, of being mm. academic. Well, hold that thought. I'm going to come back to that, but that's, that's not two minutes, is it? But I think the first thing you said is really important. Uh, the method must be the message. There's no point in saying, let's talk about interactive learning with a series of PowerPoints. So let's see what they're up to now. <laughs> Call me as the senior doctor. That's why I'm looking at my phone. Other things for other courses, you know, I haven't been able to test them yet. All right, I'm just going to call a register on it's okay. All right. Just before you call, one thing, maybe just ask about like a clinical versus cagal or and then heparin as well if they want us to start Start something like that, yeah, okay. And you've got the aspirin. I've written up a couple, so they're All right, okay, cool. And we're thinking what kind of. They're, they're using We're thinking it's probably uh, inferior. inferior. Yeah, all right. Okay. I will call the consultant now. Hello, it's Dr. Brazel. Hi, Dr. Brazel. My name is Elise. I'm one of the general doctors working in the emergency department. Oh, how are you going? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Yep. She had also chest pain about 20 minutes ago. Um, that wasn't relieved by GTN, just about my vagina, which usually responds to GTN. She um, uh, has back pain as well, high blood pressure and high cholesterol, and she has a family history of uh, heart disease. Uh, at the moment, we've given her a bit of morphine that set off the pain, and we've just tried her with some GTN aspirin as well. Mm -hmm. And her ECG shows some ST elevation and leads to 3 and ADM. Okay. And some ST depression in. Uh, the anterior septal leads. Uh -huh. well, how, how many millimetres of uh, elevation in the inferior leads? In the inferior leads, there's about uh, two millimetres of uh, elevation. Yep, okay. And sorry, what was the onset of pain? How many minutes ago now? About 20 minutes ago. Okay, all right. And yeah, she's... she's driving in a car. Yep, and has she had any um, arrhythmias or any sign of failure? Uh, no, she's got a, um, a bit of a uh, sinus happy cardiac at the moment, but no arrhythmias. Yeah, okay, alrighty. Um, well, look, I will get on to Cath Lab. I'll, I'll come down there, I'll be five minutes, but I'll give them a call anyway because it sounds like she needs to go up there. Uh, what have you said What have you said to her? Um, so we've told her that we're concerned that there is, um, based on ECG changes, that she is having a heart attack. Yep. She's said we told her that she needs to go to the ER and she's going to have to go to the ER. We were just wondering as well if you wanted us to start or a heparin infusion or anything yep. like that. Sure, yeah, no, so get the AD of Ticagrelor and um, yeah, you can give her, yep, and 5,000 of uh, IV heparin and uh, as I said, yep, and I'll be down there shortly but hopefully we'll have a plan for cath lab. So just get the nurses to get her hooked up on the transfer monitor and if you can, just start giving her a bit of an explanation about what we're going to do, okay? Okay, and my only other question is we've also ordered a full blackout and count 20 inch do you want any other no, 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 that's fine. No, we just really need to get going. So um, pull that off yeah. as fast as you can, okay? okay All right. So much, thanks so much. Okay, bye. bye. All right, we'll pull it up there, Charlotte, and you can tell everyone to come up here. Which is shame, but you know. All right, um, so obviously just some more of the same. 
in terms of how it's been done, but we've moved obviously to a different phase here and there've been some different learning objectives that we've looked at. One was explaining to the patient, so we're sort of breaking bad news really, uh, and we, we'll probably talk a bit about that in the debrief, about the conversation that they had. They've obviously, I think, appropriately decided they needed some help and so they've called. And I've got a few views on um, how well I think they did that. In fact, I think they did do it pretty well. Uh, but we'll probably talk about the conversation there. And now, because they wouldn't quite finish the scenario there, they've got actually now a bunch of things to do as a team and trying to get them done as quickly as they can. So before they come back up, any other thoughts of things I should discuss with them? How do you think they went? Did she say that to the nurse or to the patient? She said to you. To me, okay. I would have been all right with that. If she was presenting it as confidently as that, which is funny, isn't it? Because I probably make some assumptions that she knows what she's doing if she sounds like she's talking like that. Whereas maybe if someone was a bit more hesitant, I might say, how much morphine? Could you do today to where I think we write up some morphine, but without the dosage, Yeah. he would know. There's lots of assumptions. Yep. Yeah, and it's a good point, and sometimes, and you don't always see everything in a scenario. That would be a perfectly good thing. Right? <coughs> All right. Any other thoughts? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So we're going to go back in roll, just as we were before. All right. So, uh, how was that? Yeah, I think it went kind of okay. Um, I, I think my biggest concern is we didn't really, like, we maybe should have talked more earlier in the piece together in terms of what I was getting from history and what he was getting from examinations because I think like I didn't really know what was happening with ECG for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess from my perspective it was more of a I could see what was going on and I could see the ECG had changes which were ischemic, I knew were ischemic. Um, just in terms of she's doing her thing, when do I butt in? Is it a is it a sort of urgent situation where I need to go, hey stop everything, look at me, this mm. is what's happening. Or can I, do I have a bit of leniency in terms of time where I can just let her get her part sorted before I butt in? Okay. Which is kind of my um, dilemma, I guess. Yeah, and um, I think you're right. That was probably a pretty important point in the case. At what point do you do that? But you're right, you don't want to stop the flow. Um, so how would you actually know when it is? So we'll just park that for a minute because I think that's a really important point, yeah. yeah. Any other sort of general impressions? I guess you got to watch there, Shelley. Yeah. Um, I thought it was Mm -hmm. kind of really early on and mm -hmm. kind of try to figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, but like Will said, we had the communication. And also, um, I think they both knew that it was a heart attack, but it was like kind of, at what point do we tell the patient? Because the, like we never actually really told the patient until the very, very end, even after the call, like the <laughs> stuff was kind of like, and the patient was worried that she was having a heart attack. So at what point do we then say, Yep. Yep. Yeah, and I think yeah, it's quite a grey zone. Yep, yeah, but for you, you thought it probably wasn't soon enough or clear enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think on that point, I was a bit like, even though it seemed from our point of view, it was pretty sure as a junior doctor, it's a bit, you know. Should we be waiting for someone more senior to come and talk to the yeah. patient rather than us like jumping in and sort of saying we're having a heart yeah. attack? You know? well, in fact, let's talk about that right now because I agree. I think it's a pretty important point. We can come back to some of the other ones. So, I guess just to sort of frame it again, what you're saying is we've got this knowledge she's having a heart attack, and we're sort of thinking, how do we actually say this to her? And I think I heard you say we're a bit worried about your heart. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't until the patient actually said am I having a heart attack? And you yeah. went, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's true, that's a difficult conversation. Tell us more about what you're thinking. Um, I guess it was kind of, I didn't want to make the patient feel more anxious or more unsure. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to, like I, like, I know I kind of waited a bit, but I wanted to be able to talk to the senior doctor. So actually, when I confirmed it was a heart attack, I had a plan in place, even though, I, okay. you know, prior to that, you kind of know, you know roughly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. If someone comes in having a heart attack, you know, these are the steps and this is where they end up, like mm -hmm. the, getting the, the cath lab. But, you know, I just wanted to have that confirmed before okay. I said it was one thing and then they ended up having to sit there with that knowledge for a really long time while I go and do it. Okay. Details. So there's a little bit of hesitation relating to your place in the scheme of things mm -hmm. and a little bit of hesitation worried about her making her more anxious. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, look, I would 
I would understand the first one. I think the second one I, I'm less convinced about, but this might be a better question for Margaret. So uh, I don't know, you, you were worried you were having a heart attack. What, what, how did you feel about the news being broken? Uh -huh. through. Okay. So I felt there was communication going on, but not necessarily with me. Mm -hmm. The communication from the nurse was, was very good. She kept filling in the, the quiet spaces. Okay. But I guess, yeah, I would have liked to have known um, what was going on with my heart because I'm pretty, pretty certain that that's what my uh, nitrates and didn't work. Mm. Um, so. Yeah. So I suppose to offer another form of words for you there, I might say something like, yes. This ECG shows that you are having a heart attack. I know this is pretty blunt, but I don't want to beat around the bush with you. Um, but what I can say is we've got a treatment plan for you now. We can do this and we can do that. So I guess maybe sort of be very clear about what it is, but maybe also add this, uh, you know, this is what we're doing for you. So there's some faith in a plan. I don't know if that you would find that a sort yeah, of useful form of words. Sort of giving the diagnosis, but instead of making it stressful, saying it's okay though, because you're in the right hands and this is what we're going to do. Yeah, it's, oh, it's going to be stressful, whatever. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's a little bit saying like, you're a little bit pregnant. Yeah. Not quite the same, yeah. One or the other. Yeah, <laughs> okay. exactly. Um, one of the things, if I might say, Elise, that um, I observed was when you made the phone call and I felt I got a very uh, clear sense of what was going on and just enough detail that I knew what I needed to do. And I was impressed because I thought that's, that's tricky under pressure. So tell us, um, how you managed to do that? Well, I think I've noticed in the past I kind of have a tendency to um, not necessarily give a good summary at the start, which tells the doctor what's going on, and I kind of tend to waffle on and then only get to the end. So I was really conscious of that when I was making the okay. call, and I tried to really make my first sentence, you know, after introducing myself, very clearly that this is what I think is going on. Mm -hmm. I think I probably could have then maybe asked, like, say, from the start, said all what I really need to know. You know, is do you want to call the cat? Like, do we need to call the cat lab? Sure. And the questions I had at the end, maybe just sort of quickly sum them up at the start. But otherwise, I think I kind of summed things up relatively well. Yeah, I mean, I think your S statement in that S bar was very strong. Here's a lady who we think has got chest pain who's having an inferior MI. So I guess that puts me very much in the picture. Mm -hmm. And you described the ECG before I had a chance to ask you what it was. Mm -hmm. And I think you, I got just enough of the history there. So I think that was actually well done. You're right. I guess sometimes it is good maybe if you could add another thing there. So they're having an inferior MI and we're wondering if you could either come or call the cath lab and we'll do the next step. So, you know, but I, I thought that was certainly what I would um, be happy getting from an intern or even a registrar, so yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe the last point would be to come back to the one you were talking about, Will, and I think this really does get to um, the sort of teamwork between the two of you, which is in some ways good to have a helper, but in some ways challenging because you have to do this thing that people talk about in terms of sharing a mental model. So I agree, it took a little while in that history for Elise to get to know about the ECG. So. Tell me more about what, what was what you were thinking. Well, I guess in, in retrospect, if I, you know, looking back, probably something that straight away because uh, MI is one of those conditions where the time to treatment is very important. So looking back, it's probably something that I would have got her attention earlier. Mm -hmm. But my logic at the time was that looking, you know, like I said, she was taking history, she was um, doing her part of the equation, but also from the vitals and looking for my part, because my role was to look at the vitals, look mm. at ECG, all the sort of investigations. Um, hemodynamically stable, she wasn't rapidly deteriorating, so I felt comfortable that I had just a bit more time to okay. sort of slowly ease into it. Mm. Um, that was my logic. Yeah, I agree, it's so certainly grey. I got the sense there that was probably a bit long, um, but not massively too long. So if we were, you said maybe if you had your time again, it would be sooner. I don't know if any of them in the group think about, you know, what, what would be a way of nicely interrupting without, without sort of stopping the train of thought. I guess one thing we could have done is, because we sort of had a little power before we went in where we decided that I, you know, asked the questions and examined the yep. patient while he do the other things, is I suppose we could have maybe said, well, look, if you, when the ECG comes back, if it's abnormal, like, yeah. you grab me, like, like making it an invitation yeah. to... Yeah, and that's a good thought. Like if something important, like if something pops up that gives you a clue what's going on, do you want to grab me and let me know or something like that? Yeah, yeah. you could even just maybe. put the ECG on the bed. Yeah. <laughs> 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 maybe just, you know, do you mind if I could please grab a second opinion on this yeah. or something like that? Yeah, I think you're right. That's probably a good form of words that would still allow the patient to feel in it, yeah. 
Right, well, so I'll summarise in just a minute, but before we finish up the debrief, any other sort of issues or questions that anyone... Has? I guess just for me uh, as well, sort of in keeping with the when do I intervene theme, but also how much do I interact with the patient, with Margaret? Because uh, they're obviously I'm taking into account release and taking into account the nurse, and I felt as if the, their communication was okay. It's interesting to hear that maybe a little bit more communication would have been good, but I felt like there was enough communication there to get by, and you also, you know, from my perspective, I don't want to sort of overload yeah. the patient with more people and more people and more. If I say something that's a little bit different to Elise, but also, does she need something from me? From, from her perspective, is, it, is she weird mm. out by the fact that <laughs> so I think you're right. I think she needs to know who you are, but I agree. I think it's better to leave the liaison to one or two people who've been doing that directly. But you're right, weird it out. Um, at least sort of say, this is, this is Will who's working with me. And it might be just as simple as that, yeah. All right, so look, I guess just to sort of summarise, you know, Margaret is a patient we see a lot of in terms of chest pain, um, but she really did have the goods in terms of a STEMI. Um, and she's on her way to cath lab now as the appropriate treatment. But for me, the things that sort of came out of this scenario was thinking about how we assimilate our information and work together as a team. Um, certainly how we keep our patient uh, in the loop. And I think we saw a nice example of, um, of calls for help. So, uh, so thank you all for participating today and uh, we will call it up there. So we will go out of roll. <laughs> you stay here, hang on. <laughs> All right, so we've still got uh, a few minutes left. So obviously that was our debrief where really we try and get something out of what we just did because it could be very easy just to have a fun time doing a little scenario, but this is supposed to extract some understanding of what the students have been thinking and extrapolation back to future improved practice. So I'll take thoughts and comments, yeah. What um, opportunities are there, say, post this exercise for the students perhaps to demonstrate that they've been able to embrace some of the feedback that they've been given or to improve their potential practice in those scenarios moving forward from this? Yeah. Well, I guess probably these level students we think are already doing some of these things in clinical rotation, so we hope that that proof will be in the real world. There is certainly some writing in the simulation literature about achieving mastery learning in simulation, which is okay, let's go and do it again. And uh, you know, people do do that. And I, I think there's nothing wrong with that actually. Uh, and you take out some of the things that we already knocked over and you just do them again. Um, but everyone gets a bit bored with doing the same scenario. So it's trade-offs, but what you bring up is actually quite a, a topic of debate in the simulation world, yeah. Could I add to that? Yeah. Um, also, as a student, when you're doing a scenario, you are acutely aware of all the things you did wrong. You, know, you really don't need anyone to tell you what you've done wrong because it's true, isn't it? So you, you come out of there self-reflecting, full of it. You go, oh, I should have done that sooner. I should have done this. And even things that we might not have brought up here will be going through their minds. I should have done that. What they forgot. You just you, you get out of the way about that. Mm. There's a couple of things that I think are real realities in debriefing. One is if you've got a big iceberg, the debrief just really hits the top. The other is the thing that I didn't get to do here, which I normally get to do, is walk back with the students who are throwing little thoughts in the air. They started their debrief as soon as they walk out and I'm just listening to what they did to get an idea. And then the third thing I'd say is you often do get a much more negative, in that first question I ask, how'd it go? Yeah. Oh God, we were terrible. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it is very tempting as a debrief to go, no, no, you were great. But I don't think you should. I think you've got to stay there with them and go, really? What? What? Tell me. And, you know, go with them as you kind of gradually get back up to an OK keel. <laughs> um, and that is human nature, and it's particularly so for all the people who are trying to do a great job. They, you know, aim to be, do it well. Mm. Uh, do you, uh, first off, you all did an excellent job, and thank you so much. This is uh, and just after you're saying you're not supposed to say that. but. Um, <laughs> just for debrief but as a demonstration of bonds learning and teaching and so thank you so much and, and I'm just curious Margaret do, uh, the role of your acting is amazing <laughs> <laughs> it was so convincing I kept having to remind myself that this was 
a simulation and I've felt that before. So Shelley, here's the thing. So we had to do a little bit of uh, crisis management in our own simulation today. So Lee is a student and normally we have actually professional actors who play <laughs> our SPs and Lee just like jumped in for us, which was very nice of her. So um, uh, our SPs are excellent and Lee is clearly very versatile as well. So. <laughs> Oh, yep. you have to give the right answer so that it has the right triggers for the right... So how, how do you do it when you're not a patient? Or when you're not a student, sorry. That's a good question. Yeah, well, so Trish uh, helps look after our SPs. Um, I'll give a couple of thoughts, but I'm sure she's got some as well. I've worked with so-called confederates or simulated patients who are both healthcare professionals and not, and each have their advantages. So you can say to a fully trained nurse, play, or a fully trained medical student, um, play someone with chest pain. And they've probably got a frame of reference, but unfortunately their role as a healthcare professional always is an overlay on that performance. And I guess having come to Bond my, was my first really saturation experience of working with simulated patients, and they bring something quite different again, which is probably more objective in terms of their patient experience. So, um, but I'll let Trish talk about our recruitment and, and training. We, for each um, role that we um, allocate to them, we actually give them case notes. So we give them a bit of background about what kind of frame of mind they should be in at the start of the scenario. What's their opening statement? So that we actually give them the clues so that we can actually guide the scenarios through into a set way that we want them to act. There is a little bit of ad-libbing because you can never predict what a student will ask them. But we give them things like what medications they are on, what, um, what was the lead up to the incident. So that they have got some background. But we and we show them that too. Yeah. But, yeah. So we do give the, the SP some leeway as to have a bit of artistic license as well if it's not too far out of the realm of normality. So. They, we've got a core group of about 20 and then we've got another 20 or so that come for exams. So we've got a big group, different ages that will, um, that are available to come in. And some of them are amazing. They have seizures. They uh, have, yeah, I mean, it's just, yep. They act delirious, psychotic. It's just incredible what they're cry on demand, yeah, it's just quite incredible what they're able to do. And yeah. so other um, parts of the faculty, like the nutrition and dietetics program, the physio program, are also using them as well now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of thank yous from me first. Um, one thing we didn't talk about, but Charlotte is another one of our students. She was the camera girl. Uh, but Charlotte has actually done a fair bit of this for us up at the hospital as well. And we use the same FaceTime in the hospital when we're following a patient uh, who's going to the operating theatre from the ED. So we've got some new technology we've used that is just consumer level. And uh, obviously the people who aren't here downstairs, Taryn and the Renette, who also helped run things, very good. But yes, I'll also add my thank you to the students who all volunteered to do do this they did yes so thank you very much <laughs>